This is the HHW LOD Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Jordan from the HHW LOD Podcast Network, and this is what I thought of the comics I read the week of January 12th, 2011. First up, we have Deadpool issue 31, in which Deadpool finds more and more creative ways to kill vampires. And really, that summary is all there is to it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I really did enjoy the comic. He did find some fun and creative ways to kill vampires. Um, the story didn't really feel necessary, though. It just kind of felt like it was tacked on because the X-Men are fighting vampires right now. That said, when it comes to tacked on tie-in issues, it worked just fine. And I'm, of course, always interested to see what uh, Deadpool is going to do in the next issue of Ways Deadpool. Because there's a lot of Deadpool books out there. This is the only one really worth buying, that I'm aware of anyway. Let's touch on some books from Radical Publishing. I already reviewed these two last week. We had Earp Saints for Sinners and Rider on the Storm, issue number two. This week, <laughs> I actually have a review for Rider on the Storm, issue number one. I read them out of order. It's not my normal way to do things, but I got a hold of issue number two first, and I liked it so much, I went back and checked it out one. Um, when you actually read issue number one, it sets up the world really, really well, and that was something that I kind of missed in issue two, just because I wasn't getting on the ground floor. But you have a really well-put-together, noir-ish world. Uh, think kind of the canals of Venice mixed with New York City. And as in a noir story, the city should be a character, it certainly is here, and you definitely get a feel of that. Now, as I look back at issue number two, I go, oh, okay, it all fits together. But having that first issue to set things up, it really does have a sense of, I've never seen that before. And like I said last week, the twist at the end of issue number two is messed up. So, gotta love that too. Next up, also from Radical Comics, we have... Time Bomb issues 1 through 3. So I like some things in Time Bomb and others not so much. Let's start with the good. Um, the actual setup of why they have to go back in time, how that all works, the discovery of this ancient Nazi city underneath Germany uh, with a missile that's going to destroy the world through uh, the chemical warfare. Awesome. Or biological warfare, I guess. Really, really cool. I liked how that was set up. Um, the art, not my normal thing. It reminds me a little bit of the work done on League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, so good, just not what I'd normally prefer, um, but that's all just a matter of opinion. And the twist, or the first twist, I should say, even though I saw it coming kind of a mile away, it was still really well executed. I didn't see the second one coming, um, the one that ends the issue, but I rather like that one as well. So what didn't I like? Well, some of the politics of the world were a little strange, and I don't mean to say that, like, I didn't agree with the politics of the book, um... Things were just kind of thrown in as, you know, just mentions of, oh, this exists, the New World Order, but then next they're mentioning modern day events, and it's supposed to happen in 2012. So there's mention of current and former presidents, um, but there's also this other political thing where it's like, does it supposed to be set in the real world or not? Pick one. I'd appreciate it. Um, so that was a little bit strange. And the other thing I didn't love is that our four main characters who were sent back in time to save the world... I didn't feel like I ever learned too much about them, who they were, what their motivations were. Two of them, I quickly realized, because they pretty much spell it out, that the characters hate each other. So that was clear throughout the entire book, and I understood why. The other characters, uh, not a whole lot going on there. I mean, hopefully if they ever do a follow-up or something like that, they can explain more about the characters. But at this point, you know, I couldn't really invest much in them. Didn't care too much about what happened to them, simply because the backstory wasn't there. That said, though, the good definitely outweighed the bad here, and if you like a good time travel story and some good old-fashioned Nazi killing, well, uh, Time Bomb, one, two, three, uh, this is the book for you. I should mention that all the radical books, they're, they're heavy-duty, big-time books. They're double size or triple size, your average comic. This is six books here, and, uh, you know, that, that's a lot of reading. So, definitely good value for your money there. Some more great comics to get to, but before we do, don't forget to check out the brand new HHW LOD podcast network at HHWLOD.com. We've got Half Hour Wasted, that's the HHW. We've got LOD, that's the Legion of Dudes. We've also got the Walking Dead TV podcast. We've got all the shows from PKD Media, which uh, we're happy to have them aboard. We've got our brand new show, Media Minutes, where you can find these reviews in audio format. It's not just the audio ripped directly from the video. I re-record it so the audio quality is nice. I use my good microphone for that. Um, it'd be difficult here with a camera because the microphone will be right in front of my face so I don't do it here um but so definitely check that out media minutes we've got a green hornet review just went up I think true grit reviews all kinds of great stuff up there if you're interested in movies television comics uh video games or anything else we're gonna have reviews on it there so definitely check that out we've got even more announcements coming up soon I can't wait 
Website's brand new. Looks fantastic. Check it out, hhwlod.com, and let's get to our final comics of the week. Next up we have Heroes for Hire, issue number two, and know your eyes do not deceive you. That is Silver Sable on the cover of this comic. I don't think I've seen her in a comic uh, since they were printed on newsprint, so it's been a while. Now, I was a bit shaky on the first issue of this current volume of Heroes for Hire. Had a good twist at the end. I wasn't huge on the art, and it felt a bit disjointed. Um, this issue, much more streamlined. Yes, it's broken up into several smaller parts, but they all come together in the end and worked fairly well. They touch on the twist from last issue again at the end of this issue, but they don't really take it any farther than they did in issue number one. That's not a problem, because the actual content of the comic was quite good. But it is weird. Are they going to... I don't know how soon we'll be delving into that. Maybe the end of this arc, but hopefully it's soon, because I'm interested in seeing where that's going to go. I also feel a bit better about the art this issue. Misty Knight still looks a bit strange, and people's front teeth seem gigantic. Like, whenever they smile, it's like two giant buck teeth. Or four big giant teeth. It's strange. I don't really know how to explain it aside from that, but it looks kind of weird. But in general... I think the artwork's fine. The action's kinetic, and it's all easy to follow, and it's good art. Just some weird little things that I go, eh, I could, I would make a different decision. Not that I'm an artist, but, you know, what? The actual issue focuses on our heroes trying to take down an arms dealer and find where some mysterious weapons are coming from. That's all taken care of in the issue. I did find it interesting that the villain, when he shows up, is wearing the red hood. As in, you know, the villain in the red hood, but I don't think they ever mentioned that probably would have cleared things up a little bit. Uh, I'm assuming he's going to pop up in the future and they'll deal with it then, but it just seems strange they put that bread clump crumb there and then didn't even mention the bread clump. I am glad, though, that there's a lot of fun to be had in this comic. You know, after reading Iron Man, Thor, also from Abnett and Landing, who wrote this one, wasn't a whole lot to be had there. This is closer to Guardians of the Galaxy in terms of, you know, a fun group of people. It's not quite there. Hopefully, as the series moves along, the heroes are less acting separately and more acting together, like at the end of this book, where you had a Silver Sable and Ghost Rider teaming up, because that's a lot of fun. And when they're just on their own, feels like you're getting little snippets of solo books instead of an actual team book. And this is Heroes for Hire. I'd like it to be a team book, but hey, that's just my per personal preference. And then finally this week, we have The Amazing Spider-Man, issue 651, uh, where we get more of the Tron-type costume. We get more Black Cat, we get more Hobgoblin. We also have uh, Kingpin again this issue, and the backups that they've been running the last few issues focusing on Scorpion wrap up in a very interesting way. And let's actually start with uh, that Scorpion backup. Turns out he's now a Spider Slayer, and the Scorpion, probably. He's a Scorpion and a Spider Slayer. Whatever, he's gotten upgrades uh, that seem pretty cool. He's got Scorpion Sense now, which sounds dumb, but at least it'll give him a counter to Spider Sense. And there's a whole mess of new Spider Slayer characters. Reminds me a little bit of Planet Hulk, or maybe even Maximum Carnage from... Back in the day, hopefully that doesn't make your blood run cold. It wasn't my intention, just the look of it. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see where that goes. It looks like there'll be the next big villain arc, or uh, maybe in the future, even past the next arc, maybe they'll be back around uh, for good. But in our main story, Spider-Man once again is fighting the Hobgoblin as well as the Kingpin, and uh, it really is a fun story. We get more of the costume and how it works. He's got several different modes on it, apparently. And those modes, although why they were designed to help him, turned out to be a bit of a detriment in some ways, and I liked how that worked. There was consequences to his work and to him trying to update himself that, uh, that actually played out in the narrative of the story, so props there for sure. By the end of the story, Phil Ulrich, the new Hobgoblin, is well on his way to even more mirroring Peter Parker, which I like. I like that element of the story. And the Kingpin is also forced a little bit further along in his narrative, working with the Hand Ninjas and... Uh, following in a certain Daredevil's footsteps, but uh, we'll leave that for another day. All in all, though, the first arc of Big Time, I really enjoyed it. I know not everyone likes Bacalo's art. Uh, it, it's one of my favorites, so sorry. Um, and the story worked. I really like the addition of Hobgoblin. I really like how Dan Slott laid out some of the newer, th the newer elements, such as Peter's new job, and how that's tied into a lot of different elements of the story, not just Peter, but some of the villains as well, and the costume, and Black Cat coming in, and it it all really feels cohesive, and I'm enjoying it, so I cannot wait for arc number two. So that's it for the comics I read the week of January 12th, 2011. Uh, don't forget to check out hhwlod.com for all the brand new stuff we've got there. Follow me on Twitter at JordanFRMJersey. That's at JordanFRMJersey. The link's uh, below the video here, so check that out. Follow me on Twitter. 
have a great week and uh, see you next time. And don't forget to check out the audio version of the reviews should be up uh, this coming following weekend, hopefully. This is the HHW LOD Podcast Network.